All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to my my talk today about um, for ways that parents can support a child with eating disorder behavior. My name is Dr. Michelle Miller. I'm a clinical psychologist here at NYU Child Study Center. I'm looking forward to discussing this topic with all of you. Um, you can submit your questions at any time today by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel that's on the right side of your screen, and we'll answer questions at the end of our presentation. Um, so today I'm going to be exploring, you know, hoping to help you understand the role of an eating disorder as a maladaptive coping mechanism, um, explain the off-the-cuff parenting style, discuss how to replace your child's maladaptive eating disorder behavior with instead healthier coping tools, and highlight the importance of the family unit. So to begin with, you know, thinking about you know, why, you know, with parenting, like how, you know, how our child learns their basic needs around eating. And as a parent, you begin with being in tune as your child is an infant to providing for their basic needs. They cry when they're hungry, and you respond to that. You provide them with food. They cry when they're tired. You give them, um, you put them down to sleep. Um, and then as for their emotional needs, when they get the stress, you offer them support and reassurance um, when they're sad, when they are asking for things, the material things that they don't need necessarily, or they're doing something that's not safe, you're able to set limits and say, no, you can't have that, no, you can't let go of my hand when we're crossing the street. Um, and you're cheering up your child when they're upset. Um, and when the child is learning things and mastering things, you, you express your pride in them. So they develop a sense of mastery. And over time, your child internalizes that kind of like having a parent within themselves learning, you know, that, you know, my, when I'm hungry, I eat. There are limits in life. And, you know, my, I need to listen to my feelings and respond to them. And so that's the development of a healthy child. Um, you know, but however, at some child, sometimes the child can have almost like an internalized, strict, mean parent internalized within them that's not responding to their needs. And so this is the development of the eating disorder. You know, it's kind of like a strict, critical person in their mind with lots of rules that aren't meeting their body signals. So when a child feels I'm thinking or feels like I'm hungry, you know, this, you know, instead of responding, okay, it's time to eat, there's like, well, you know, too bad, you know, you don't deserve this. Um, and over time, you know, the child is over, is obeying these strict eating disorder rules or eating disorder behavior. Um, and these rules tend to be very strict and rigid and cruel. Um, so why? Why does anyone develop eating disorder behavior? That's often a question I hear over and over again from parents, as well as from people experiencing eating disorders. And there's not one answer. We know factors that make it more likely that someone will develop an eating disorder, um, you know, certain personality characteristics, being more perfectionistic, lower self-esteem, um, having difficulty experiencing um, uh, distress or negative emotions, having you know, depression, anxiety, um, ex being exposed to things in their environment that are really focused on physical appearance, having stronger sensitivities to um, textures, smells, temperatures, um, particularly around food. All those things can make it more likely that someone will develop an eating disorder, but doesn't guarantee. There's no set um, traits that someone has that makes them definitive um, definitely likely that they're going to have an eating disorder. There are lots of people who have these traits and they have no eating problems. And then on the other hand, people who have none of these traits and they develop eating disorders. We do know also that in times of stress, people are more likely to develop an eating disorder. And that um, really goes back to um, this notion that eating disorder is a way to cope with stress. Um, 
but you know, many parents will often feel guilty and feel like, what if you know, I cause this in some way? And we can't pinpoint a reason. Um, and right now, the most important thing is that your child is struggling, and you are so important and so essential in their life, and as well to their recovery and keeping them safe. And so really, the important thing is, like, what can you do now? So um, many of you may have heard of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. It's a theory to understand why people are motivated to do what they do, what gets them going, what makes them engage in certain behaviors. And um, as you can see from this, you know, people go up from the bottom to the top to reach um, self-actualization, their full potential, but they need to meet all their other needs first, their basic needs, their psychological needs first. Um, and as you can see in the chart, Someone with an eating disorder isn't getting up there. They are stuck at the bottom. They are not getting their needs met for food and for water. So they can't feel secure. They're going to be behind in their intimate relationships. They're not going to feel good and, and accomplish um, and go further from that. Um, they're really stuck there. And everything else, all their other needs fade away. You know, everything is really about food about what they take in. And as a caregiver, you you have such an important role in get taking care of those bottom needs and then helping them get back to all those other needs, needs for safety and their their um, need for intimate relationships and love and self esteem. Um, so think of really it's helpful to think of the eating disorder as a coping tool a way that someone is coping with their stress in life. And one, you know, one thing that's important with that is keeping in mind what can I do, you know, as a parent to model use of health, healthy coping tools. So it can be helpful to kind of create a list of what are some of the disorder behavior that you're concerned about. Are they not eating enough? Are they, you know, having a very limited variety of foods? Are they using condiments or artificial sweeteners too much? Are they exercising too much? Are they taking too long to complete meals, complaining a lot around food? You know, write down, think about what your child needs, the areas that they are using potentially as coping skill behaviors they need to improve upon. And think about in general overall, you know, what this reflects. You know, that they are, you know, some other behaviors that they you know, they are not engaging and that could be used as coping tools and how you can model for that, that for them, encourage that. So if they're not good at asking for help, you know, you showing that you're honest with your limitations, that you ask for help, they're not great at coping with mistakes or you're also maybe, you know, as a parent, you may not, you may struggle with also feeling guilty and about, you know, when you make a mistake, being able to express and view mistakes as opportunities for learning. Um, being able to, you know, set limits on yourself, not taking on too much, you know, especially if you know your child takes on too many different activities, too many things, too many academics. Um, being good at saying no to other people, um, being able to model that, being able to say no, um, again, setting limits. Um, being able also to take care of yourself, do nice things for yourself if you see your child not engaging in those self-care behaviors. Um, an eating disorder um, often described as, as a tempest tantrum. If you imagine when your child was very young and what they looked like when they were having a temper tantrum, um, you know that when someone has, you know, starts to have that temper tantrum, that if you gave them, gave them to exactly what they wanted, it would go away right away, but then it would come back whenever they wanted that that you'd expect a lot more tantrums. If you each time they have a tam temper tantrum, consistently ignore them, it would get worse and worse and worse. They'd cry, they'd scream more and more and more, but eventually they'd settle down and it would go away. And then if you're inconsistent, you know, sometimes you go to the supermarket and they cry, you know, when they get to that, the end of the aisle that they really want that candy bar or that toy, um, and you, um, sometimes you give it to them and sometimes you don't, you know, that kind of variable reinforcement, it, you know, it, it makes it, the tantrum keep coming back. 
Um, so think about what you did, how you dealt with it, how they respond. Um, and eating disorder is very much the same way. Like in their minds, the eating disorder is producing distress, you know, calling your child names, putting them down, making things around food seem very distressing, providing negative thoughts around food. Um, and then your child, if they're not having coping resources to deal with all of that, which many of them don't, then they give in. They do what the eating disorder wants them to do, whether avoiding food or eating a certain amount or over-exercising. Um, and that helps them feel better for a short while, but then it reinforces it and the eating disorder keeps coming back. Um, if, you know, the tantrum comes in, those negative thoughts come in, you know, maybe they'll try and ignore it and try and push it off, but then the tantrum worsens. It gets worse and worse and worse. And that's where if they have coping strategies where they can learn to, to deal with that distress, like let's say they ask for help, tell their parents how they're feeling, discuss their feelings. Um, you know, that may help them get through that eating disorder and or the tantrum from the eating disorder and the eating disorder becomes weaker. Now you'll notice that I'm often talking about, and I'll talk about it, um, the eating disorder as separate from the child, externalized. We're talking about the eating disorder, not the child. And that is so important because, um, as you've noticed, like the just eating disorder behavior can make your child act very, very differently from how they typically act. And it becomes very problematic when a child is seen as the problem rather than the real problem is the eating disorder. So it's so helpful as a family to get together and to see we are all together fighting this eating disorder. You know, make a name for it, color it, create a face, an image, or cartoon. Know that we're all together working to fight this common enemy, and that eating disorder is the enemy. So, you know, you want to avoid in this situation thinking of this as a power struggle. Again, you, know, you are all together fighting this eating disorder. Um, so I'd like to talk to you in, in this realm about the off-the-cuff approach, which was designed by Nancy Zucker at Duke University in her research um, and treatment of eating disorders. Um, and we want to think of it not just as like this is an approach for disordered eating, but a parenting style that's effective overall. It's also effective in any relationship. These are great techniques when interacting with anyone. They're good techniques for life in general. It's a style of communicating, of establishing roles, and it can be very effective. So thinking about breaking this down. So C is for clear. Um, you know, being very, you know, not leaving any room for the eating disorder to misconstrue, mis, to, um, mis, to mess up, you know, what you're saying, to uh, mess up your wording of things, to, you know, assume nothing. You know, you want to be as specific as possible. So, and this is great, you know, for with any solid relationship, but especially with parenting. You know, saying go clean your room is enough, being specific, saying you need, you need to pick up your clothes, put them in the hamper, you know, vacuum your floor, dust, um, just like with some of the eating stores saying, you know, eat all of your, your sandwich and complete your chips and drink your milk, all of it. So being very clear, being very specific, assuming nothing is, you know, can be mistaken. And, you know, of course, you also want to think about their developmental age and the language that you use. Um, un, you is undisturbed. And this is, of course, easier said than done. But it's so important to feel cool, confident, and matter of fact. Your child is experiencing distress and is having this eating disorder, eating disorder voice in their head that's telling them a lot of negative things. And it's very scary for them. And so, so it's so important for you to be this calm person, not anxious and joining with them in this. Um, and even if you are not feeling this way, and I can tell you, 
no parent is feeling happy and calm when their child is struggling with an eating disorder. It's very distressing. But you want to just like, if you're going a job interview, you may feel really, really nervous, but you want to go in showing that you're confident, showing, I got this. Um, and that message, make it sure that that's clear to your child. And you know, think about when you're on the plane, as an example, and you're the flight attendant, the, um, uh, when they're the pilot comes on and they, you know, calmly say, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, we, I hope that you are enjoying your flight. Yeah, I want to inform you that uh, it's important at this time to fasten your seatbelts, and I'm putting on the fasten seatbelt lights. You're going to experience some light turbulence over the next few minutes, um, and we will turn off the fasten seatbelt light when you're able to unfasten your seatbelts and go about the plane. Um, thank you for flying our airline, and we hope you enjoy the rest of our flight. So very calmly, you know, saying what's going on, even though there's turbulence going on, maybe they're stressed about that, but they're not showing it. They're helping everyone to feel calm by just expressing that. Okay. So when you are undisturbed, you want to communicate that you know what you're doing, that you can handle this. The situation is no big deal, nothing to worry about. You know, you want to, you don't want to display that you're that anxious parent, that you, um, you're not insisting that you may res um, respond something like, oh my gosh, don't be upset. You know, it looks like a lot of food, honey. I'm sorry. I know it's a lot. Ugh. Is this okay? Instead, you want to be that calm, undisturbed parent. You, this is the, I'm 100% confident this is the amount of foods and types of food that your body needs in one meal, and this is what you need to grow and stay healthy, and I'm sorry if this is tough, honey, but I'm happy to sit with you as long as you need and to work with you through this, and I will be with you there every bite. You know you have us. You've got your back. So really expressing that you're calm and you're there, but you know what you're talking about. Um, when someone experiences an emotion, you know, these emotional waves, they rise and fall and can be very intense. So someone gets distressed, their emotions get higher and higher. And when they're on the top of this emotional wave, they're not thinking logically. Um, they're just in their emotional mind of the stress. And they're going with their emotions and with the negative voices that their mind is telling them in relationship to the, um, their emotions. And so for you, it's so important, you know, for you, while they're climbing this emotional wave, for you to be on the beach, for you to express that you are in a calm place, that you're waiting for them. You, you know, one of the biggest issues that can come up is if you are, you know, there joining them on the top of the wave, getting distressed or trying to reason with them. There's no reason or logic at the top of that emotional wave. Um, you, do you want to um, collaborate with them, validate their experience, let them know, you know, we're both getting upset, you know, let's just take a moment, take a break, I'm going to take a break, and then we can come back to this, but I'm here for you. Um, let them know that you're there and, and wait for the emotion, the waves to ride down, but at the same time, don't belittle them. Don't don't say something. You want to avoid saying things like, oh, you're on the top of the wave again. Um, I guess I'll have to wait. So really, instead, validate their experience. You know, I can understand this is hard, and I'm here for you. Let's, let's take a break from this. So we're going to continue. And any time that they show any improvement or calmness or pushing through that emotional distress, praise it. Praise it, honey. Um, and then, you know, uh, the next um, firm is also really important. Again, you want to take into context your, you know, your child's developmental age and, you know, where they are, like, maturely, where they are mentally, where they are in their actual age. And um, express you know, confidence in what you're doing um, and confidence in natural consequences as well if they're not falling through with appropriate eating behavior. Um, you know, think 
but of course realistic view for them. You don't want to push them into things that they're extremely fearful of. That's what and depending on the type of uh, treatment that you're working through. Um, so thinking back to Maslow's hierarchy, this, health is number one. They can't, you know, grades, being on the varsity no, soccer team, their Mandarin classes, ballet, none of that matters if they're not eating well. Their health is always number one, and you want to express that in their language. Tell your child things like, you know, if it's a young child, preteen, something like your meal is your medicine, and if you can't take that medicine, that tells me that you're very sick because even people in hospitals are taking their medicine. You may need to just go up to your room and rest and restore your strength, and then we can try again later. Or if they're, you know, someone older, you know, saying things like eating and rest are so essential to your health, and I'm seeing that you're not listening to that hunger and fatigue. You know, I want to follow your suggestions and allow you to be independent, but if your suggestions are not healthy, you know, I'm going to have to lean in more because I love you dearly and I want you to do well. Um, and then if you are, if you're, you know, funny is the other part of off the cuff. And by no means is eating disorder or eating disorder behavior funny in any way. It's, it's serious. But on the other hand, we need to not take ourselves too seriously. So I'm not saying to laugh at your child in any way. But laugh at ourselves. Like, did you ever think that you'd be begging your child to eat a cookie? You know, did you, you know, think about the silly things you say and the mistakes you may make, you know, throughout this parenting while your child is going through this? Embrace the fact that you're learning and growing, and you're going to learn through this process, and no one is perfect. Don't expect perfection. In fact, you know, showing your imperfections and they can make mistakes is great modeling for coping for your child. Um, so, again, you know, as you are, you are the family, and together as a family, you want to fight this eating disorder together. It's not the child. It's about you as a team working together. You know, and each of you will have different roles. As a parent, you are supporting them through the eating disorder behavior. The siblings, maybe you are like cheerleaders and telling jokes and making your child laugh to, to help and make the meal more enjoyable. You want to avoid feeling like there's a power struggle um, and you know, feeling like there's a lot um, that you know, you're fighting back and forth with a child and it's really you're fighting against this eating disorder behavior. And so I do have up here some resources, um, some books about, like, there's a link up here to the Off the Cuff Manual that you can get by Nancy Zucker for younger kids, like six and under, you know, Raising a Healthy, Happy Eater. Parent Handbook is a great book for more picky eating um, at that age. If your child's experiencing an eating disorder in their teen years, Helping Your Teen Beat an Eating Disorder is a great, a really great reference. Um, there's also, um, if you're doing treatment like FBT, Mosley Parents is great, and of course, National Eating Disorder um, Association. Yeah. I'm going to answer a few questions we have at this time. Um, so, going first, you know, how do you encourage a child who's stressed by a move or change in school, in school um, to stop eating in access in response? So if a child's engaging in overeating, um, and really, you know, again, like this eating disorder is a coping skill. So focusing on the food and the eating and telling them to not to eat or stop eating completely backfire. Instead, you know, displaying you know, positive coping strategies. Um, you know, maybe taking them out for doing some relaxing, showing them different coping behaviors. And depending on the level of the stress, it might be helpful to reach out to, to provide them with um, a therapist to have them evaluate it to see if they, their stress is you know, so intense that they may need to um, learn some strategies that clinical settings to address that. Going through some modeling that coping behavior and then helping them develop that. Another question is, if there is um, overeating in a household with different age members, is the strategy the same? So, you know, each, each person um, is in their experience of an eating disorder is different, um, depending on the 
ADHD approaches are different with overeating and also about why you know, if a person is overeating out of emotional reasons, are they just more hungry? Do they have a thyroid issue? Um, definitely, if there's overeating, it's really important to get them, as well as any eating disorder behavior, get a full medical workup. Um, you might get one, well, get hormone workup, um, check out blood levels. And also, um, you know, if someone is overeating more because of the stress, it might be helpful to seek um, treatment for that, as well as using some of the strategies we talked about today, if it's a child. Um, what to do with a child who refuses to engage in a conversation about the disorder. So if, you know, at times, it can, this disorder behavior is really, really hard to talk about. Um, it's a way that the child is coping with the stress, and talking about the eating disorder can potentially bring up further distress, and the child obviously doesn't have those coping mechanisms to cope with disorder, potentially not even the stress that comes about talking with it. Um, so it might be helpful for them to have, um, you know, I would, you know, ask some questions in general just about how they're feeling, um, what their experience is like, allow them to be open to you rather than you being open to them. Um, if you're working with a therapist, I would collaborate with a therapist on what's going to be helpful to get them speaking to you, depending on the person. And also, if they're working with a therapist, you know, that may be easier for them to talk about because it's you know, someone separate um, from the person that they, they're interacting with all the time. And then another question I just got in is, um, how do you help a teen who's not eating all day if you're not with them? So with that, I would definitely, again, you know, have them evaluate with a doctor. There is a condition um, called ARFID, um, Avoidant Restrictive um, Food Intake Disorder, in which can cause difficulties with, which relates to someone who has difficulties with sensory issues so that they avoid food or very low interest in food that they won't eat unless prompted or, or made just because of low interest not related to weight the image concerns. Um, and they may need treatment for that um, through cognitive behavioral therapy. So you may need to find an expert um, in that, such as through our center, um, who can help a child with that condition if that's what they're going through. And of course, check in with a doctor and make sure that everything is medically cleared. And the last question I have is, does the Child Study Center have a program for children with eating disorders? And yes, we do. I am part of our wonderful eating disorder program that's head up by our psychiatrist, Dr. Melissa Nishawala, and we have eating disorder professionals um, in our New York City office, as well as in Hackensack, New Jersey, we have a satellite there. We also have an office in Long Island, and so we have eating disorder professionals there with experience of a range of eating disorder problems, from overeating, undereating, food sensitivity, you've seen it all. And um, you can reach out at any time to myself or others to learn more information about that. So um, on behalf of the chi our Child Study Center, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. And once you leave the webinar, you're going to receive a survey. And we really appreciate it if you could complete it. Um, you're also going to receive a follow-up email in a day or two that's a link of today's um, presentation. And we really hope that you can join us for next webinar on um, my child doesn't need more stimulation, so why should I treat his ADHD with stimulants by Dr. Jumani. Um, and that will be on Wednesday, February 28th at 1 p.m. Thank you again. Take care.